Next, he moved to the United Kingdom, first at the University of Oxford and second at the University of Cambridge, where he's currently professor of biophysics and director of the Center for Protein Misfolding Diseases. Michele made many fundamental contributions to the study of protein misfolding, aggregation, and disease. Just to mention a few, he developed methods for protein structure determination using normal chemical shift and residual dipolar couplings, developed computation and end experimental methods to study protein homeostasis, and discovered many small molecules able to prevent or treat protein misfolding diseases. You can post your question at the end of the talk after the second speakers. And we thank you, Michele, for accepting our invitation. Please, the audience is looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you, Danilo, for the uh, kind introduction. And also thanks, uh, Ram, for, uh, for, Rams for organizing the, the series. It's a great pleasure to have the chance of, uh, of talking with you. So I'll be telling you about our research at the Center for Misfolding Diseases, um, which uh, we founded uh, with Chris Dobson and Thomas Knowles in 2014, so about eight years ago now, uh, with, the, with the scope of uh, studying the fundamental process of protein misfolding and aggregation, its links uh, with human disease, and hopefully to use this understanding to develop uh, um, diagnostic and therapeutic uh, tools for combating these, uh, these diseases. Since uh, four years, the Center for Insulting Diseases is hosted in, uh, in a new building, the Chemistry of Health Laboratory, which has been funded by the UK government in, uh, um, in uh, in combination with uh, um, industrial partners and benefactors, um, with the scope of uh, promoting the translation of fundamental research into clinical applications. Um, so for this reason, in addition to the Center for Insulting Diseases, the Chemistry of Health Laboratory hosts uh, an incubator space uh, on the ground floor, which currently um, hosts uh, Rent Therapeutics, uh, uh, which is a, a spin out company that we founded in uh, 2016. Again, with Thomas and Chris, and uh, with Sarah Lins and Lund, Johnny Habschke, and Sam Cohen that were working uh, with us uh, in the center at the time. So, Rent is, uh, you can think about it as the translational arm of the center. And uh, in particular, it is uh, implementing the drug discovery strategy that I'm going to explain today. Today, I'm going to tell you about a sort of academic uh, foundations of, uh, of the approach that uh, then Ren is exploiting and taking forward. So we are, we are you know, studying protein misfolding diseases and uh, I'll, you know, I'll talk mostly about Alzheimer's disease because this is the diseases that we are focused uh, on initially. And, and so if we want to do drug discovery for Alzheimer's disease, it's really a very uh, complex issue. Uh, so if one looks at the uh, possible causes uh, and the processes that are perturbing the disease, there is a very, very long list. Uh, so we know, you know, from genetic studies, GWAS, that, uh, you know, certainly clearance pathways are perturbed. Uh, so the lysosomal autophagy pathway, ubiquitin in proteasome pathway, uh, certainly uh, they are disrupted. But many other things are disrupted, like uh, mitochondrial processes are disrupted. Oxidative stress is certainly a play. Neuroinflammation, uh, certainly at the end, uh, and possibly also at the beginning. Um, uh, at the beginning, so you know, really lots of cellular processes that are uh, are being involved in the disease, uh, possibly all contributing to some extent uh, uh, to causation. But what we focused on, because of our background, is uh, is the process of protein misfolding and aggregation, because in disease we know in Alzheimer's that uh, um, uh, at the molecular level, uh, the characteristic uh, sign is the presence of uh, protein deposits, amyloid plaques formed by um, amyloid beta peptide and other factors. 
and inside the cells and neurofibrillary tangles, which are formed by another intrinsically disordered protein, tau. So we know that uh, these, uh, uh, these aberrant assemblies are characteristic of the disease. Uh, and furthermore, this is not just the case for Alzheimer, but a, a, a fairly long list of other human uh, conditions uh, that uh, uh, include a, a, a wide variety, uh, other brain conditions, uh, Parkinson, dementia, with Lewy bodies and so on, Huntington, ALS and so on. And then other systemic disorder or localized in certain organs uh, um, uh, like type two diabetes. Uh, um, th th there, are, there are many conditions that are characterized by protein misfolding aggregation. So it makes sense to uh, investigating to, uh, to investigate the fundamental uh, uh, links uh, between uh, um, protein aggregation and uh, um, cellular uh, si um, toxicity. So where we start from is, you know, uh, we start asking the questions where protein aggregates comes from. Because we know that, uh, uh, you know, the normal uh, fate of proteins after biosynthesis in the ribosome is to fold and uh, be, you know, trafficked uh, in, in the right place in the cell or extracellular, uh, as in this uh, illustration, and then, uh, you know, perform their function and be recycled. So this process is very effective, um, and, uh, and, and, and therefore the system is robust, except that, uh, you know, in, cert in certain cases it can fail, uh, proteins instead of folding can misfold, uh, and uh, if, if they do, they obviously are not functional at that point, uh, and they can they have to be recycled. Uh, and for that reason, there is a very effective quality control system, uh, which is called the protein homeostasis system, which in various ways, in this slide, is shown the protein uh, uh, ubiquitin proteasome protein system that uh, degrades misfolded proteins. There are other um, other processes that they can also take care of proteins in folding, particular molecular chaperons or, or autophagy. So all is well with this process of quality control until uh, uh, we um, we age, because at that point uh, um, you know the protein homeostasis system because at least partially impaired and therefore is not so effective in removing misfolded proteins. At that point, at that point, uh, proteins can aggregate and uh, can either form monomorphous aggregates or even ordered ones like amyloid fibers. And if they do take the path to amyloid fibers, they can uh, be cytotoxic. <clears throat> And so, you know, again, the quality control is very effective in removing the aggregates, but uh, sometimes, uh, again, in old age, uh, uh, it fails, uh, and uh, these uh, protein deposits, protein aggregates are, uh, start accumulating, eventually uh, generating uh, disease processes. So, uh, <clears throat> so you may ask uh, why, you know, there are these other uh, pathways open uh, to proteins. After all, uh, you know, the, in order to be functional, they sh should fold into the native state. And so it would seem peculiar that they can do also uh, other things. In fact, what we know today is that uh, in addition to the amyloid state, uh, which is uh, accessible at least under certain conditions in the cell, there is also another state, a liquid-like condensate state, uh, which is also uh, available to proteins. And in fact, uh, is a uh, you know, new function for this type of state. The condensate state uh, are, are discovered almost every day now. So, you know, in particular, these proteins can form membrane-based organelles that are uh, carrying out uh, you know, a, a really wide variety of function. But again, the point is that uh, you know, there are at least uh, three fundamental states ac accessible to proteins in the cell, the native state, the amyloid state, and the liquid uh, condensate state. So again, it may seem peculiar because uh, uh, you know, this opens the possibility of uh, uh, misregulation in the system. And in fact, what we did with Uri Hartle, uh, we did a proteomic study in which we, by taking a model system, in this case, uh, C. elegans, uh, we performed, um, you know, we looked at, uh, for all the proteins that we could, um, you know, characterize by uh, 
uh, mass spectrometry, we looked at the uh, total abundance of the protein itself and uh, the abundance of the uh, soluble fraction. And so we partially, to our surprise, we found that uh, the large majority of proteins in C. elegans are expressed at uh, levels above their critical concentration. So in other words, uh, the total abundance exceeds uh, the soluble abundance. So this means that uh, effectively proteins are super saturated. So the reason why we see condensed state, both liquid-like and solid-like, is because proteins are, um, you know, are not thermodynamically stable in their native states because the concentration is so high in the cell uh, that the, the assembled state, the, the, the liquid state and the solid states are more favorable thermodynamically. So the reason why they don't convert uh, uh, more frequently is because there is a high um, free energy barrier uh, that uh, makes the transition uh, uh, very unlikely. Um, and so it's really, you know, we should think about uh, protein uh, misfolding diseases as uh, almost a victory of thermodynamics uh, uh, in, in the case of, uh, of protein. So um, our task for drug discovery is to, 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 to try and um, facilitate the work of the protein homeostasis system in keeping uh, the, the proteins in this metastable states, the nanti state uh, in which they are functional. So how do we do that? Well, we take a closer look at the protein aggregation process itself. Uh, so uh, in this schematic view, we start from the reactant, the monomers on the, on, on the left, and we are, end up with the product, the amyloid fibrils on the right. So what seems to matter in, 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 uh, in cytotoxicity are not these two um, end states, so the, 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 the initial and, and, and the in the end state, but, but the intermediate uh, uh, states, uh, these, these small soluble assemblies or protein oligomers, which seems to be particularly in cytotoxic. So in, in our um, 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 fight, you know, in, in our search for, for, uh, for a drug, we are going to target not just aggregation, the aggregation process in general, but the formation of this oligomeric intermediate. So we have a sort of target within a target. So in order to successfully uh, um, address this problem, so which is reducing the number of oligomers uh, that produce during aggregation, we will need to understand a bit better how they are formed. So what we know is that uh, um, if we can build a sort of kinetic model of the process, we know that there are several microscopic steps uh, that uh, um, are involved now. Um, uh, so again, starting from monomers on the, on the left, we know that there is a primary nucleation process that leads to the formation of uh, in disordered oligomers. Uh, uh, it's important to notice that these disordered oligomers are not yet nuclei for the formation of amyloid fibers because they need to convert, to undergo a conformational conversion, uh, which again is limited by a free energy barrier in which uh, you know, uh, there must be a formation of cross beta uh, structure inside the disordered oligomers. And then uh, this can become really a seed, uh, a fibril seed. And then if the fibril seed is, uh, um, is, um, is formed, it can elongate by monomer addition and, and, and another process that is limited by a free energy barrier. And then most strikingly, when fibrils are formed, they can uh, uh, catalyze the formation of uh, new oligomers. In this case, uh, uh, um, the process is called secondary nucleation uh, because uh, um, it requires uh, not just the presence of the monomers, but also of the fibrils themselves. And it turns out that the, the, because the, it is autocatalytic, this, uh, this step uh, is responsible for the um, you know, exponential increase in aggregates uh, after the, um, the aggregation process has started because the, the, the rate of formation of new aggregates depend, depends on the, um, uh, of the, on the mass of the aggregates already present. And, uh, and so most oligomers, uh, uh, you know, after the reaction has started, uh, are formed through the process of secondary nucleation. Uh, 
And another you know, aspect of this process that is, uh, is worth mentioning is that the oligomers uh, um, are uh, uh, very unstable. In fact, uh, at least in the case of Amylac Vita, the large majority of them dissociate. They not, do not convert into fibrils, uh, but they instead dissociate. So this is uh, in, you know, encouraging uh, because we can think of promoting the dissociation, for example. Or, or, or we can think of stopping the secondary nucleation, or we can think of stopping the conversion. So we have multiple strategies that are in principle possible. We just don't know which one uh, is the most effective one in reducing the overall number of oligomers uh, produced during uh, the overall aggregation reaction. And, and so the complication here is that uh, the, the amyloid beta, in the case of, uh, of Alzheimer, um, uh, plays different roles in this process. Uh, it plays the role of the reactant, uh, because it starts as monomeric. It plays the role of uh, the product, because uh, it is uh, forming the fibers at the end. It plays the role of intermediates because it forms the cytotoxic uh, oligomeric intermediates. And also it plays the roles of catalysts because the fibers can then catalyze the formation of new oligomers. So, you know, these uh, multiple roles of amyloid beta make it difficult uh, to understand uh, where to bind. In fact, we know uh, that, uh, at least in, in our hands, it's very difficult to establish a relationship between binding affinity towards any of the states of amyloid beta in the process and oligomer production. Um, so we cannot just do drug discovery by optimizing the binding affinity for a given uh, species or, or, or multiple of them, because we just don't know, don't know the relationship between the binding affinity and the number of oligomer produced. So we need to find an, another, um, um, another route. In this case, uh, uh, what we thought is that we can exploit the fact that uh, uh, we can get access to the relationship between aggregation rates. So the rate constants of the various microscopic steps, uh, nucleation, elongation, and conversion, and so on, dissociation, and the oligomer production. So this is a kinetic-based drug discovery because now the parameter of optimizations are these rate constants. So we are going to look for small molecules that uh, alter the rate constants of the process in a way that is specifically inhibiting the formation of uh, oligomeric intermediates. So how do we do that? Uh, well, we have, a, you know, you know, I guess there are many strategies that are possible in this uh, in this general context. But the, the specific way in which we, we, we have uh, at least originally implemented it is in, is in three steps. And the reason is quite simple, because as I said, if you look at the time series, uh, uh, time course of an aggregation process, what you are interested in is in the population of oligomers, which are shown in red here. Uh, so because we start from monomers, initially there are no oligomers, then there is a peak in the population, and then the population of oligomers goes down because everything converts into the final product, which, which, is, uh, which are the fibers. So, you know, ideally we would like to just to measure this population and find molecules that reduce uh, this uh, red peak. But in fact, we can't uh, because it's very difficult to, to perform these measurements on the oligomers, although I'll come back to that. So what we do instead, we measure something that we can measure, which, is, which are the amyloid fibers. So we measure not the intermediates in the reaction, but we measure the products, so the fibers. And then, and this is step one, so we develop a, a method uh, that can be a high throughput to measure the amount of fibers producing the reaction. And then we have a, a, a model uh, to uh, extract the population of oligomers from the population of the fibers. So the fibers are the product, and the oligomers are the intermediate. So we have to go back from the product to the intermediate. So we need a kinetic model for that, and I'll explain uh, although quickly how that is achieved. And then at the end, because we really want to do you know, drug discovery, we cannot really uh, uh, continue with just a model of the amount of oligomer produced, we really need to measure them. And for this, uh, we, we, we have to um, develop tools, uh, methods uh, for measuring really this red curve uh, and not, not just uh, extrapolating it uh, from the population of the fibers. So I start with uh, the first step, uh, which is a, a measurement of the uh, 
uh, of the of the products which are fiber so for this we can exploit uh, certain dyes that uh, become increasing fluorescence once they bind uh, to amyloid fibers there are several dyes one famous one is called thioflavin t so if you monitor the time course of the aggregation reaction now you the amount of fibers produced can be uh, 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 measured by the fluorescence intensity of this dye. These measurements are possible, but they're very noisy. Here, if you, this is just for illustration, is what happens if you repeat the experiments uh, many times. So uh, lots of noise, and this is not very good for drug discovery because in high throughput, uh, you, you end up uh, mixing um, true positive with, uh, with false ones. So what we did in collaboration with Sarah Linse, and she mostly did the work. Uh, so we made this type of measurements highly reproducible. So you know, in a way that uh, now we can measure the dose dependence of a drug. So here we, we see that uh, you know the black curve is the unperturbed reaction, so amyloid beta by itself, and then we start adding a compound that inhibits the reaction, the production of oligomers. We can see those dependence. So now the problem is that we can inhibit the fiber formation, but as I said, this is not our goal. Our goal is to diminish the oligomer population. And now the big surprise is that, uh, you know, if uh, um, we have a compound that uh, inhibits fiber formation, we can have uh, literally any outcome on the population of oligomers. We can reduce the population of oligomers as well. We can leave it un unchanged so despite the fact that overall the fibers appear more slowly the oligomer population is not changed and we can even increase the number of oligomers produced during a reaction even if the reaction overall is slowed down so we really need to be careful about which microscopic step uh, we uh, we stop or inhibit uh, with our small molecules so in order to do this, I'll, uh, we, I'll, I'll take you briefly through the uh, chemical kinetics uh, uh, um, formulation, which essentially is, is a tool for going from the measurement of the um, um, you know, reactants and, and products to the, to, the, to the population of an intermediate. So we have the time dependence during the reaction of the population of the intermediate states. And so we can do that because if you think about the reaction, you have monomers that nucleate into uh, oligomers and oligomers that uh, elongate into fibers, fibers that catalyze um, the formation of new oligomers. All these uh, steps that I'm explaining in words can be, uh, you know, translated into a, into a mathematical formula uh, that, that just describe how one state converts into another state. And so uh, and as a function of time. So we can keep track of the population of the different states, including the oligomeric states. And because we measure the reactants, we have you know we have things that we can measure in this in this reaction and therefore estimate all the other quantities, including the, the rate constants and the population of the intermediates. So at this point, we can actually calculate uh, the, uh, from the measurements of the fibril mass, the, uh, um, we can calculate the number of oligomers that are produced in the reaction. So we call this a structural activity relationship by kinetics because the, activity, the type of activity that we are after is a kinetic activity. And so now we can measure, we can do drug optimization. So we can select uh, uh, compounds which are increasingly potent by requiring that they improve uh, uh, this, uh, or that they inhibit the rate of production of, uh, of the oligomers. And now very quickly, I'll, I'm going to explain how we carry out the first step, which is the direct measurements of the oligomers. So now we can do this only um, you know, for very few cases uh, when we have a compound that is already promising because these measurements are um, uh, very difficult to carry out uh, with, uh, with accuracy. In order to do this, uh, we develop a, an oligomer-specific antibody. So we would like to have this uh, uh, antibody that uh, is for, uh, for which uh, 
monomers and fibers are invisible. So if we add it uh, to an aggregation reaction, this is only going to recognize the oligomers, at least in principle. So we are sensitive. So we can measure directly the population of oligomers. In order to de design this, uh, to um, produce this oligomer-specific antibody, we use a technique uh, of uh, antibody design by computation. And uh, in, in very quickly, how it works uh, is that uh, if we have an antigen like the beta peptide or a region in the beta peptide, the epitope in red in this slide, we can go into the protein data bank and look for instances in which this uh, red target uh, is uh, found within a beta sheet. In that case, uh, we, we have a complementary peptide already offered to us by nature the red one, which uh, we can use as a paratop and graft it onto a, a CDR loop of an antibody. So this works uh, sometimes if we are lucky with the entire peptide, almost never. What happens more frequently is that we have to build uh, the complementary uh, peptide fragment uh, by fragment. But the process uh, is, is working well and we can implement it systematically for any epitope of choice. So if for a beta, we perform, we, this enables us to perform an antibody scanning, which is a procedure in which we can select, uh, for example, five, epitope, five different epitopes on the sequence of a beta so that we can cover the entire sequence. Since I'm running a bit out of time, I'm going to skip quickly uh, through some passages and, and tell you that it's possible uh, to arrive to an antibody uh, that uh, recognizes a specific uh, region of the, uh, of the beta peptide that is, is exposed only on the surface of oligomers. And therefore, uh, it achieves the goal that we have, uh, which uh, you know, monomers and fibers are invisible. And if we add, uh, um, so if you look at panel D here, we have an aggregation reaction, which unperturbed is in blue. And if we add this molecule here, um, it, it, the, the fiber formation is retarded. But now if we use the anti oligomer specific antibody, we can measure the oligomer population uh, in the amperture case, which has this peak uh, that is characteristic of the oligomer population. And then if we add a small molecule, we can see that in this, in this case, uh, the, uh, the uh, inhibition of the, the retardation of the aggregation process, the fiber formation, corresponds actually to a reduction and delay in, in the oligomer population itself. And then we can test further whether this compound can uh, rescue um, a, a preclinical model of, uh, of a disease, in this case, C. elegans. Again, we find that uh, adding this compound, giving this compound to worms that are transgenic, so they express the beta peptide, leads to uh, not only a reduction in the aggregate uh, formation, but a specific reduction in the oligomers that are produced. Again, we can use this oligomer in, in, uh, in the, to detect in, in C. elegans, uh, uh, the oligomer-specific antibody to, the, to quantify the oligomers. And so, you know, although I illustrated this strategy with, with the, the case of uh, a beta, um, the amyloid beta peptide in Alzheimer, uh, you know, we believe that this is quite general. In fact, we have started using it uh, for, uh, for um, alpha synuclein in Parkinson and tau in, again, in Alzheimer, IAPP in type 2 diabetes, and so on. And, and so with this, I, I would like to thank my collaborators, Chris Dobson, as, as I mentioned, Thomas Knowles, uh, Sarah Linse Sam Cohen, and Johnny Hatchke, uh, and uh, many other members of the uh, Center for Mixolding Diseases that have played a, a, a you know, overall a very important role in, in uh, many of the uh, pieces of research that I've uh, described today. And thank you for uh, your attention. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michele, for this really inspiring talk. And I think that uh, we can, uh, as we decided before, we can move directly to the second speaker. And then we go to the Q&A session at the end of the first talk. OK, um, so then if we're, if we're moving on to the second speaker, then uh, it's uh, um, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joel Watts, who'll be uh, giving the second uh, talk today. Um, and uh, Dr. Watts, uh, 
obtained his PhD in uh, laboratory medicine and pathobiology from the University of Toronto, um, and then went on to postdoctoral research um, in the lab of Stanley Prusiner uh, at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, Joel is currently a uh, principal investigator at the TAN Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases in Toronto um, and associate uh, professor uh, within the biochem Department of Biochemistry at the University of Toronto. Um, and he holds Canada Research Chair in Protein Folding uh, Misfolding Disorders. Um, his research interests include studying the role of self-propagating prion-like protein aggregates in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Um, as well as exploiting the unique properties of the bank full prion protein to develop superior animal and cellular models of prion disorders. Um, and it looks like uh, today he's going to be talking to us about um, strain behavior of pathological protein aggregates. Alrighty, so Joel, looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the, the kind introduction, and thank you very much to the uh, organizers of this uh, uh, exciting seminar series for giving me a chance to speak about uh, some of the research my lab has been doing over the past seven or eight years looking at the uh, the role of alpha-synuclein misfolding in the uh, the variability inherent to, to neurodegenerative diseases. And so uh, I'm coming to you today from a uh, University of uh, Toronto, not too far from the uh, the hub of the seminar series in, uh, in the University of Michigan. And so what I'm going to be talking about today uh, relates to Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease uh, after Alzheimer's disease, of course, and it's a predominantly a, a movement disorder. And at the um, sort of under the microscope, the, the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease is the presence of a proteination inclusion in the brain called the Lewy body. So here's a picture of a Lewy body in, in a neuron right here. And the main component of Lewy bodies uh, is a uh, misfolded aggregated protein called alpha-synuclein. And alpha-synuclein uh, under normal healthy conditions is a, uh, a very soluble protein that has um, some extent of uh, uh, alpha helical structure depending on, um, on, on sort of which uh, uh, sort of uh, side of the, uh, the debate you fall on about the structure of normal alpha-synuclein. And during disease, it polymerizes into a, a beta sheet rich protein that uh, polymerizes into aggregates and then deposits in the brain. And so alpha-synuclein is not simply a, a marker of disease in Parkinson's disease. It's thought to be intrinsic to the disease uh, process. And this is because mutations uh, or multiplication of the alpha-synuclein gene uh, result in early onset forms of, of Parkinson's disease. And I, um, I can't say that alpha-synuclein is the only uh, player in Parkinson's disease. It's certainly, it's a very multifactory, uh, multifactorial uh, disease with the involvement of uh, other biology, such as mitochondrial biology. But alpha-synuclein is thought to play um, an important role. And in, indeed, alpha-synuclein inclusions are found in the, the vast majority of, of patients with Parkinson's disease. And in today's talk, I'll be um, uh, mentioning two different uh, disease-causing mutations in, in the alpha-synuclein gene, uh, A53T and G51D. So Parkinson's disease is not the only disease to feature um, inclusions of alpha-synuclein in the brain. There are actually two other diseases that collectively are called the synucleinopathies, the common denominator uh, of which being that they all have alpha-synuclein um, aggregates. And so these three diseases, Parkinson's disease, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, and uh, multiple system atrophy are very clinically and pathologically different. And so there's differences in clinical presentation. So Parkinson's disease is initially at least mostly a motor uh, disorder, whereas um, uh, in Lewy body dementia, the, the uh, cognitive changes are the first things that are noticed. They can progress at different rates. So multiple system atrophy progresses at a much uh, faster rate than does Parkinson's disease. The brain regions that are affected uh, either by neuronal loss or by the presence of inclusions are different. And uh, finally, and perhaps most importantly, the cell types affected uh, by alpha-synuclein pathology are different. So in Parkinson's disease and, and, and dementia with Lewy bodies, you get the formation of Lewy bodies mostly in neurons, and whereas in multiple system atrophy, you get the inclusions mostly in oligodendrocytes. So the question becomes, how can you get three completely different diseases caused by misfolding of the same protein into aggregates? And the hypothesis that we and, and others have been working with is that the, the clinical and pathological variability in the synucleinopathies might be caused by the presence of distinct alpha-synuclein strains within the brain. 
before I get into the topic of uh, uh, alpha synuclein strains, I need to go off on, on a little bit of a tangent uh, and to talk to you a little bit about the work of a German neuropathologist called Heiko Brock. And so what he did uh, was to look at the brains of people who had died of Parkinson's disease, uh, with late stage Parkinson's disease, people who had um, uh, sort of earlier stage Parkinson's disease and people who didn't have Parkinson's disease at all. And what he found when he uh, examined the, for the presence of Lewy bodies in, in the brains from these individuals, he found that they did not occur randomly in the brain. They seemed to follow a stereotypical progression pattern starting first where in people who are, were uh, clinically unaffected, Lewy bodies might be present in, in the brainstem and then in people with sort of mid-stage disease, then they would move up into the substantia nigra and the amygdala. And then finally, in people with um, later stage disease, you would find them in the cortical regions of the brain. And this non-random distribution of Lewy body aggregates, uh, one potential explanation was that they might be uh, spreading from cell to cell, similar to what happens in the prion diseases. And so what are prions? Well, prions are uh, infectious proteins, uh, the most sort of well-known prion diseases are, of course, mad cow disease. Uh, in humans, uh, it's called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And the way prions work is that they are infectious proteins. So the misfolded aggregated prion protein is able to act as a, a template or a seed to introduce the misfolding of the normal prion protein into additional copies uh, of the bad version. And this allows the um, protein misfolding cascade to occur throughout the brain and eventually cause disease. And so if you're studying um, human prion disease using, using mice, you use uh, transgenic mice expressing the human prion protein and you inject them with uh, a sample that contains some pre-existing prions, in this case, human CJD prions. And then you wait for a little while and eventually the mice will develop clinical signs of disease. Now, based on the aforementioned um, sort of prion-like potential spread of alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease, researchers did a similar experiment with alpha synuclein. So basically the same experimental setup. The only difference is that instead of having mice expressing the human prion protein, now you have mice expressing human alpha synuclein. And they were intracerebrally injected with mice um, uh, or injected with samples containing uh, some pre-existing alpha synuclein aggregates. And this is a work from the lab of, uh, of Virginia Lee done by uh, Calvin Luck. And so what they found is that these mice, because they express a mutant form of alpha synuclein at quite high levels, that they actually develop a spontaneous motor uh, disease themselves, that's the blue line here. However, if they gave them a, a pre-existing seed of, of alpha synuclein aggregates, uh, then the mice um, got the disease much quicker, suggesting that these uh, pre-existing alpha synuclein aggregates can act as a seed to initiate or accelerate uh, the formation and spread of alpha synuclein aggregates in the brain, just like prions can. And um, when these studies were coming out is when I was, when I was doing my postdoc in Stan Prusner's lab and we were doing very similar studies. Uh, and we were doing it using the same mouse model and these mouse mice are called M83 mice. Uh, they're uh, a very widely used mouse model in the Parkinson's field. Uh, they express uh, human alpha synuclein containing the A53T mutation. And normally these mice um, exist as what are called um, homozygous transgenic mice, which means that they have two copies of the of the transgene array, so they express very high levels of this mutant protein. And that's what causes them to get spontaneous disease. So what we did to sort of increase uh, our ability to discern a disease acceleration is we crossed these mice with non-transgenic mice to create what are called hemizygous transgenic mice. And these mice only have one copy of the transgene array and therefore they express less synuclein uh, in their brains. And these mice actually, at least in our hands, do not develop spontaneous disease during their normal lifespan. And so whereas the homozygous mice develop a spontaneous motor disease, um, sort of between 300 and 600 days of age, these mice can live healthily up until about 600 days of age. And so we were doing some of these similar inoculation studies, um, specifically trying to get at the question of do brain extracts from patients with Parkinson's disease have some sort of seeding activity in them that could um, accelerate the onset of, of disease in these mice. And so what we do is we take uh, brain extracts from, uh, from patients with these diseases. And we injected them directly into the brain of the mice using uh, a freehand um, non-stereotactic technique that is the common way um, to uh, transmit prion disease. And coming from the Prusner lab, this is sort of why I, I started doing these, uh, this method. And we injected uh, samples containing uh, from Parkinson's disease patients, 
Uh, as a positive control, we injected samples from these homozygous M83 transgenic mice. And we happened to have some samples of the, this other synucleinopathy, multiple system atrophy lying around. So we decided we'd do that uh, in parallel as well, just to see what happened. Uh, and here's what we found. So if you inject these mice with a control brain extract, then they, they live happily for a one year post inoculation, which is the point we, uh, we stopped the experiment. Uh, the positive control of mice uh, using the uh, brain extracts from the spontaneously sick transgenic mice, they took about seven months on average to develop a uh, disease. Uh, and disappointingly, none of the mice injected with Parkinson's disease extract developed disease within uh, the time frame that we looked at. However, we were really surprised that all of the mice essentially that were injected with the multiple system atrophy brain extract developed disease and they did it much more quickly than what we thought was the positive control uh, with these uh, the transgenic samples. And so this got us thinking about the concept of strains because we had these differences in incubation periods because if anything, the MSA case it has had less aggregates in them and it was wild type synuclein so there was a synuclein mismatch between the, um, the sample and the mice. And so we thought if anything, they should be slower, but they were actually faster. So this led us to the investigate whether or not we might have different strains of alpha synuclein. And, and this is another concept borrowed from the prion diseases. And so in, in prion diseases, you can have different um, sort of clinical variants of prion disease, different genetic variants. And these are all caused by the presence of distinct strains of, of prions in the brain. And so the idea behind a prion strain is that you can have a single uh, monomeric protein precursor that can misfold in several different ways to generate um, uh, structurally distinct aggregates. And then these aggregates then cause uh, distinct pathologies and clinical manifestations uh, in the brain. And this concept of the prion strains being uh, rooted in distinct structures of protein aggregates, has, I think has now been um, established beyond a reasonable uh, doubt um, based on the, the beautiful um, cryo-EM studies for, uh, for tau from, um, from Cherez and Gader. And so our hypothesis and the question that we wanted to test was, do alpha synuclein strains, conformationally distinct um, aggregates, uh, induce distinct diseases in mice akin to what you would get with, with prion strains? And I, I'd like to say that we are certainly not the only lab tackling the question of, uh, of alpha synuclein strains. There's been some beautiful work done by uh, Virginia Lee and uh, Ronald Melke, Verla Bakelant, Mark Diamond, uh, Claudio Soto, just to name a few. And so we really wanted to focus on, do you get truly distinct diseases? And the uh, experimental setup is uh, as follows. We started off with uh, recombinant uh, human alpha synuclein and we included the A53T mutation because this is the sequence that's expressed by the M83 mice that we use. And we know from the prion field that if you have a good, if you have a perfect sequence, mis, uh, sequence match between um, substrate and, um, and aggregate, then uh, you can get um, the most efficient transmission. And so what Angus Lau, a, a former master's student in the lab did is he polymerized uh, this protein um, in a bunch of different conditions to identify um, those buffer conditions that produced aggregates that looked the most different to us. And in the end, he settled on polymerizing the aggregates either in the, the presence of sodium chloride to uh, form what he called the salt or S fibrils or in the absence of sodium chloride to form what he uh, called the no salt or NS fibrils. And uh, the work I'm gonna to talk to you about over the next few slides was all done by, by Angus and as well as a, a current PhD student in the lab, Raphael So. And so the first thing we did was, was to uh, ensure that the, um, these two different preparations of, of recombinant alpha synuclein aggregates were actually conformationally distinct. And so we used uh, several different uh, in vitro assays. The first thing we did is we looked at the uh, curcumin emission spectra. So curcumin is an amyloid binding dye so we reacted the fibrils with curcumin and then uh, dialyzed out all the unbound dye and then took their uh, emission spectra using a plate reader and found that they're very different from each other. So they had uh, clearly distinct peaks, which um, could be suggestive of distinct um, sort of backbone conformations of, of, the, uh, of the aggregates. Uh, under the electron microscope in collaboration with the Holger Villa, we found that the uh, no salt fibrils were much longer on average than the salt fibrils. And this could potentially suggest that the uh, salt fibrils are a little bit less stable and there can, uh, therefore can fragment more readily. 
uh, using a, uh, an assay that again borrowed from the prion disease called the conformational stability assay in which you take the fibrils and you expose them to increasing concentrations of, of guanidine hydrochloride to see how, how much guanidine do you need to, to solubilize these fibrils. We found that the, uh, the no salt fibrils were in generally um, a little bit more stable than the, than the salt fibrils. And lastly, um, again, using a technique that is very um, common in the prion disease, which is digestion with, with protease, in this case, proteinase K, we found that the, the pattern of the, the protease resistant uh, alpha synuclein fragments that we got after digestion were quite reproducible and distinct between the, uh, the salt fibrils and, and the no salt fibrils. So based on this, uh, we convinced ourselves that, okay, we have uh, two different, uh, uh, let's say polymorphs of, of alpha synuclein aggregates, and we wanted to see what um, do they cause distinct biologies when um, propagated in a mouse model. So we went to our uh, trusty hemizygous M83 mouse model, and we injected equal amounts of the uh, salt and no salt fibrils into the mice. And this is what's called the first passage. We waited for these mice to develop disease. And then when these mice got sick, we took their brains, we made brain extracts and then injected those into a second set of mice and so on and so on for, a, and, and the third time, it went, it's called the second and third passage. And this serial passaging experiment is critical to determine whether you have truly distinct strains that can maintain distinct um, biological ma manifestations uh, over several passages. Uh, the first readout we looked at is um, how fast do the mice get sick? So this is the, uh, the incubation period, uh, which can be used as sort of a surrogate representation of the, um, the rate of progression of the disease. And so uh, in all three passages, uh, we noticed that the, uh, the mice injected with the, the no salt fibrils or the, or, the, or the brain extracts from mice uh, derived originally from no salt fibrils had longer disease incubation periods than the mice inject with the, uh, the salt fibril derived uh, preparations. And in all the, um, the graphs, I'm going to show you the, uh, the no salt fibril uh, data is always in red and the, the salt fibril is always in black. So then we next looked at the, um, the neuropathology of these mice. And so we stained brain sections from these animals with an antibody that recognizes phosphorylated alpha synuclein. And so um, phosphorylation of alpha synuclein at serine 129 is a very good uh, marker of a disease associated alpha synuclein. And so we found that, uh, and these are graphs of um, sort of the relative amount of, uh, of alpha synuclein pathology in nine different brain regions within the injected mice. And what we found is that there are some brain regions in which pathology was equally and highly present for both uh, preparations. So for instance, uh, the brain stem, uh, the midbrain, and the hypothalamus. However, um, with the um, mice that were injected with the, the no salt fibrils, we found that regions of the of the forebrain, so the hippocampus, the, uh, the, the cortex, and the olfactory bulb seem to be uh, uniquely affected uh, in, in mice um, that were given the, the, the no salt strain, whereas there's little to no pathology in, in the mice uh, injected with the salt fibril strain. Just to give you uh, one example, oops, sorry, of what that looks like, uh, here is the hippocampus, uh, specifically the, the dentate gyrus region of the hippocampus from mice injected with either the, the salt fibril, the no salt fibril strain. Uh, in the salt fibrils, there's basically nothing. In the no salt fibril, uh, the mice or the hippocampus is just chock full of this alpha synuclein pathology. Um, now, zooming into a, a brain region in which um, uh, there was aggregates present with both strains what we found is that the aggregates themselves look very different. And so in mice injected with the, uh, the salt fibril strain, we could see all these sort of smaller alpha synuclein inclusions that filled up the neuronal uh, cytoplasm to give them what we called a ring-like appearance. And this was constant across all three passages. Uh, in contrast, in mice injected with the, the no salt fibril strain, uh, the pathology looked very different. Uh, the neurons typically had a single large aggregate in them that looked much more like the, the Lewy body aggregates that you get in people with Parkinson's disease or, or dementia with Lewy bodies. And so it seems that um, these alpha synuclein strains were behaving very similarly to, to prion strains in that they can induce a distinct alpha synuclein pathologies. And they also seem to affect distinct cell types within the brain. 
So here again is this is staining for phosphorylated alpha synuclein, and what you're seeing here are astrocytes that have alpha synuclein inclusions in them. And these um, uh, uh, astrocyte pathology was unique to mice injected with the no salt fibril strain. So we saw essentially no positive astrocytes in the in the mice injected with the the S uh, the S strain. And so this means that alpha synuclein aggregates seem to be able to, to target distinct brain regions and cell types, just like like prion disease. And I I will say that the um, the sort of the phenotypic manifestation of of, of the no salt strain. Is, is a lot closer to what you see in, in, in human patients with Parkinson's disease or, or Lewy body dementia in terms of the, the morphology of the aggregates and the presence of um, inclusions in astrocytes um, than what you get with the, um, the salt fibril strain. And then lastly, um, to, to look at whether or not we could find sort of a biochemical difference in the, in the injected mice, we again turned to this conformational stability assay and we found that the induced aggregates in the mice injected with the, uh, the no salt fibrils shown here in red were again more stable than in the mice injected with the salt fibrils, mimicking what we originally saw in the original fibril preparations. And then lastly, looking at the, um, um, the proteinase K digestion uh, pattern, we could see uh, differences as well. And so both strains produce this uh, sort of dominant nine kilodalton proteinase K resistant band uh, the biggest distinguishing factor was that all of the mice injected with the no salt strain had this additional uh, lower band of around seven kilodaltons. And so from these studies, we concluded that yes, recombinant alpha synuclein strains do indeed uh, induce distinct synucleinopathies in mice, just like you would expect if they were behaving similarly, similarly to, to prion strains. And so going back to this concept of, of prion-like spreading of, of alpha synuclein aggregates, there's actually... Um, sort of a comp a two competing hypotheses to explain why you could get this apparent temporal progression of, of, of aggregates. And this is a, a figure from a nice a review from a few years ago from uh, Dominic Walsh and, and uh, Dennis Selko. So in, in the, the prion-like or pathogenic spread hypothesis, you get a physical movement of aggregates uh, originating in one cell uh, to another, where then this aggregate can then act as a seed to induce the formation of, of new aggregates in, in the recipient cell. However, that's not the only possibility. The other possibility is that there could be um, a gradient of, of, of susceptibility in the, in, in the brain to, uh, to developing protein aggregates. And this is called the selective vulnerability hypothesis. And so here uh, in the early stages of disease, when the sort of the stresses are, are relatively mild and only neurons that are the most vulnerable to developing the aggregates are going to um, develop them first. And then later on, as the disease progresses, as things deteriorate in the brain, uh, the conditions of stress become uh, much more amplified. And then later in the disease process, um, more initially more resilient neurons will then start to develop uh, the aggregates. And that any kind of perceived, perceived temporal or spatial temporal spread could not be due to the direct transfer of proteins, but instead maybe a diffusible uh, metabolic factor. And so as, as a good Canadian, I think, uh, and not wanting to offend anyone, I think our, our data is actually supportive of both models and that the fact that we get maintenance of these different clinical pathological phenotypes across several um, passages uh, implies that we have to have some sort of conformational templating going on, which requires physical contact between the, um, the, um, the aggregate and the, um, and the substrate. However, it's clear that certain strains target um, certain brain regions and cell types and therefore there has to be an aspect of selective vulnerability going on as well. So in the uh, last few minutes of, of my talk, I just wanna to talk to you briefly about a, another study that we, that we recently submitted. And this is um, you know, all of our original work is uh, dealing with um, you know, proteins that originated in, in a test tube and not um, actual you know, human uh, disease material. So this is a work done by a, a recently graduated PhD student from the lab, Heather, Heather Lau. And so what she did was to compare the transmission behavior of uh, multiple system atrophy samples to samples from uh, this genetic uh, Parkinson's disease uh, version caused by the G51D mutation in alpha synuclein. And, and the reason we were interested in this mutation was that it has been reported that this mutation causes pathology that is sort of mixed in between uh, Parkinson's and an MSA-like um, phenotype. And so we wanted to see does it behave like one or the other in the transmission studies? And the results uh, you know, of that question were, were 
very obvious and that uh, as we and, and, and many other groups now have shown is that the multiple system atrophy very robustly, robustly uh, induces disease in uh, these mice. However, uh, after 18 months, uh, we still had no overt clinical symptoms in the mice injected with Parkinson's disease, which um, other groups have now shown and, and we showed earlier that uh, is typical for cases of sporadic Parkinson's disease. So it seems like this G51D mutation behaves much more like sporadic um, Parkinson's disease than MSA. However, when we looked in the brains of these mice, despite the fact that they had no obvious clinical symptoms, uh, and comparing them to a group of age-matched uh, mice that uh, weren't injected at all, uh, and then looking for um, um, the presence of alpha-synuclein aggregates in the brain, which we commonly do by um, digesting the brain extracts with an enzyme called thermolysin, and then looking at the, the insoluble fraction. And what we can found using either antibodies directed at total alpha-synuclein or, um, or phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, we could find the presence of protease-resistant uh, detergent insoluble alpha-synuclein in all of the mice that were injected with the Parkinson sample, suggesting that, okay, even though they're not sick, they do have something going on in their brain. And when we looked at the, the brains of these animals by um, neuropathology, again, staining for this phosphorylated alpha-synuclein, uh, looking first at our controls here, these are the MSA-injected mice, and these mice have abundant pathology in them, uh, this sort of, again, ring-like pathology that is seen with the, the we saw with the S fibrils, uh, and the pathology is widespread in the brain regions uh, affected. So there is clear um, migration into the brain parenchyma and, and, and spread. Uh, in the mice injected with the Parkinson's sample, we saw something very different. So first, the, the aggregates themselves looked quite different. So they were very, they're much more compact and, and dense. And again, including some that look a little bit like Lewy bodies. And so they were, um, again, more similar to, to a Parkinson's patient than, than what we see with the, the MSA sample. The other thing was the location of the aggregates. And so these aggregates were really only present in regions of the brain that are in proximity to uh, say CSF distribution pathways. And so it seems like they would get, um, after initial inoculation, we would get um, sort of migration of the seeds around the brain and they would sort of take hold in these uh, certain brain regions and they would start to spread into the parenchyma a bit, but they were doing so very slowly and not able to sort of uh, progress to a more widespread distribution that one might think would cause uh, the, the clinical symptoms in the mice. So why might this be? And so Heather again turned to our, our trusty conformational stability assay to look at the, uh, the differences in um, stability of the multiple system atrophy versus the, the Parkinson's disease uh, aggregates. And it was, um, they're, they're very, very different from each other. So the, the Parkinson's disease aggregates are much, much more stable. And this is uh, studies using the original human samples to begin with. And so you really need something like four molar guanidine before you start to um, solubilize the aggregates from Parkinson's disease, whereas as little as two molar um, guanidine will solubilize the aggregates from multiple system atrophy. And so this suggests that the Parkinson's disease aggregates are much, much more stable, which is why they may not be able to propagate very well in the brain. And when we did the same studies on, on the brains of the inoculated mice, we saw the exact same thing. So basically the, the induced aggregates from the MSA injected mice were very uh, unstable, whereas we got comparatively higher stable aggregates in the mice injected with Parkinson's disease. And so what does all this mean? And so this is how our, uh, we're currently thinking about it. And so if you have uh, the case of a more rapidly progressive alpha synuclein strain, so this could be multiple system atrophy, or like the, um, the salt fibril strain. So you have aggregates that uh, might not grow to be as big and they might fragment more easily, which allows them to break off and potentially exit the given cell more readily and transit to a neighboring cell where in the neighboring cell, they can act as a nucleus uh, or a seed to induce the formation of new aggregates in the recipient cell. Now, in the case of more slowly progressive alpha synuclein strain, so this could be for instance, Parkinson's disease or, or dementia with Lewy bodies, which we, we've done studies with and shown basically behave very similarly to Parkinson's disease. So in here, you may have larger aggregates that grow um, to be uh, quite big in the cell. They have a harder time uh, fragmenting and therefore probably because they're larger, have a hard time escaping uh, their, um, their source neuron and, and being able to transit into um, a neighboring cell uh, where they there can act again as a seed to induce the um, formation and growth of an aggregate in the recipient cell. 
And so what this slide doesn't take into account is that there's clearly is an additional layer of complexity uh, with the respect of um, with selective vulnerability uh, of, of neurons. And so why that might be, that's still anyone's guess, I think. It could be due to the presence of specific receptors on cells, it could be due to something else. And I think that's sort of going to be uh, an area of, of intense research in the coming years. So just to wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, all the members of my lab that have contributed to, uh, to these studies. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, sort of some of my collaborators. I mentioned uh, Holger um, for the electron microscopy studies. All of the uh, human brain tissue studies are done in collaboration with Martin Engelson and, and Brad Hyman. Uh, we did some studies with, uh, I didn't talk about today with, with uh, Dave Plunerman's group. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank um, the, um, the funding sources, particularly Parkinson Canada and, and Peddling Parkinson's, uh, who gave me a, a, a seed grant um, a few years ago to uh, sort of really kickstart these, uh, these studies in my lab. Uh, so with that, I thank you for your attention and we're happy to take any questions uh, during the panel part. Okay, thanks, Joel. It's a great talk. So I think if I understood the format correctly, we're opening questions to, uh, to both speakers now, is that is that right? Yeah. Um, so let's see. I think there was one for Michaela in the in the chat in the Q and A section. Kind of went in early on. Um, I don't know. Are you able to see that, or would you need that? Um, uh, no, I can see that. Um, okay. Great. All right. Uh, so the first question is: um, since uh, many of these uh, proteins that aggregate also undergo liquid liquid phase separation. Should one include the description of this, phase, you know, condensation process in the in the in the study? Um, yeah, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, I think it should. In fact, uh, uh, one can think of two pathways for aggregation. One is the one that I described, uh, which uh, we may call deposition pathway, uh, because it goes directly from the monomers to the aggregates, although in multiple steps. And the other, we can call it condensation pathway because it goes through the liquid condensate. And so, you know, we don't know which one of the two is, the, is relevant to disease. Maybe uh, different proteins in different diseases, uh, you know, one is right. So we don't know yet that, uh, but, uh, but certainly uh, in, at the fundamental level, we can start this process. In fact, we, we have done it for alpha synuclein already. And so we can calculate it, do the kinetics for uh, for this particular process here. So I think it, this is an excellent question. It should be really considered. The, the second question is about the fluorescence uh, assay for measuring amyloid aggregates. And uh, because it's difficult, uh, what are the factors that are relevant in, uh, in setting it up? Well, this is really, uh, you know, one has to be very careful about many, many different things, but uh, two in particular we found are uh, really crucial. One is the using recombinant proteins. So, you know, you get your proteins not from vendors, uh, but from, you, you make it yourself in, in, in bacteria. And the second is that you have to use uh, quiescent assays, so no shaking. Uh, this introduces all sorts of uh, possible artifacts. And, and perhaps a third factor that is also important is to use different uh, assays uh, to measure different uh, um, rate constants for different microscopic steps. And then all the rate constants should um, you know, be fitted simultaneously uh, so that one gets confidence that the process is well uh, modeled. So just, so, I just wanted to follow up on that. I think this is similar to a question that just popped up as well. I was just curious. So you said you always do these assays quiescent. So, so that means no mixing at all during the timeline of the fluorescence assays for kinetics. Is that correct? Did I read that? Yeah, the, 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 I mean, the, the, because, you know, uh, it, it's uh, possible to speed up the aggregation process in the assay. And also the reproducibility of the assay by shaking. So, you know, but shaking introduces air water interfaces, and these uh, interfaces tend to catalyze the formation of aggregates. So, you know, uh, it, it, you know it, it is not likely to be relevant in vivo, the air water interface is a catalyst, and therefore, uh, you know, shaking works well, but is not really um, relevant. <laughs> 
Makes sense. Okay, so looks like we have some questions for Joel. Um, one from Martin Mushall. So are, are you able to see those, Joel? Yes, I, I can. Um, and so Martin's question is, uh, could the different strains of alpha synuclein in vivo simply emerge because they form under different uh, growth environments provided by um, different cell types? And I think uh, the answer to that question is, is yes, absolutely. And certainly um, uh, Virginia Lee has published some really nice work showing that aggregates that, um, that form or are passage through oligodendrocytes of, uh, generally attain a more uh, aggressive phenotype. And so I think there is sort of a certain uh, you know, cellular milieu that can contribute to the, the formation of different strains. Although uh, I will say that um, a very active area of research in my lab right now is to um, look at the question is, can you get the formation of different strains under identical condition? And our, the answer to that is almost certainly yes. And so I think there is also an aspect, um, a stochastic aspect of it, where the initial misfolding of alpha-synuclein um, could be to several different um, energetically favorable um, uh, states and that sort of by random chance which one forms and then is able to propagate will then dictate the resultant disease course. And so I think it could be a mixture of both, of both sort of um, the stochastic nature of protein misfolding as well as the, um, the initial cell type that the, uh, the misfolding event occurs in. And then there was a, a second question there from Astrid G. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Do you think that the spreading of strains is a general feature of all or most amyloid diseases? Um, potentially. Uh, so in, um, in, in the prion diseases, you have a, a, a protein that exists on the cell surface. And so it's, it's very easy to conceptualize how it will spread from, from, from cell to cell. And, uh, and the same is true to uh, for a certain extent with A-beta. So that is a secreted peptide that exists in the extracellular space. And so you know, spreading between different regions of the brain doesn't necessarily require um, exit or entry be, uh, into a cell. Now for um, the, the intracellular protein aggregates, so alpha-synuclein, tau, um, TDP43, SOD1, uh, certainly that there is research out there suggesting that all of these um, protein aggregates can exhibit um, uh, prion-like abilities and their sort of um, uh, their ability to function as a, as a, uh, as a seed and, and induce pathology in, in cellular or animal models. Uh, I'm quite confident that, uh, that the sort of prion-like spread hypothesis at least contributes to the uh, pathobiology of the synucleinopathies and, and most likely the tauopathies as well. Whether it um, actually uh, occurs with other proteins like TDP43, uh, SOD1, uh, Huntington, things like that, I think that's still uh, an open que question that's deserving of additional research. Looks like the uh, the next one's over to Michaela again. So this is about the uh, yeah, so from an anonymous person about whether or not how how, how much the molecular models from A beta could be helpful in the, in the drug discovery process. So it's an interesting, it's like a bit of a broad question, almost a comment. But, uh, yeah, no, of course, but you know, it's a very good question because I only talked about kinetic based drug discovery, which is a bit unusual. So you know the. The question, can you do structure-based drug discovery? Yes. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, we have been, you know, really thinking about that uh, uh, extensively. W one um, strategy that I think is very promising is to stabilize the native state of the proteins that aggregate. You know, stabilization of the native state is a standard, you know, approach in drug discovery. So the, the problem with these proteins is that they are intrinsically disordered. So one is to find a way to use small molecules to stabilize this disordered state. Uh, you know, at, at least in the case of a beta, we, we, we seem to be able to find uh, uh, small molecules that do exactly that. And the trick is to look at the uh, complex between the small molecule and the disordered the monomeric state of A-beta is a disordered complex. So the, in other words, it's not a lock and key mechanism that we, we are going to use, but uh, some type of disordered binding mechanism. And with this, uh, we can really solubilize uh, um, um, A-beta in a monomeric form. So yes, there are, 
many conceivable ways of doing structure-based drug discovery. Um, they are all very, very difficult, uh, uh, but there is uh, certainly, you know, promise ahead in that. All right. Um, ah, yes, and then for Joel, for the salt and non-salt fibrils, do you think there's only one polymorph of, in each of these samples? And I think, I think, uh, I think I know what you'll answer here, but interested to hear your your comments. Right. So, um, no, I think in a given test tube that it's it's more likely that you have um, a cloud of confirmations. This is the sort of the the buzzword in the field these days, and that you have um, a confirmation that is dominant that gives that are responsible for the sort of overall biochemical properties of the sample, but you have lower abundance species, which may be less energetically favorable that can exist in equilibrium. Um, and so I do think likely that each independent tube uh, contains probably a mixture. And certainly we have seen um, in individual preparations, different um, fibromorphologies morphologies by electron microscopy uh, you see in those proteinase K digestion things that you get multiple different bands, which could indicate could potentially indicate uh, different polymorphs. But what we do seem to see is that you don't seem to get any kind of mixtures once you inject it into the mice. And so that to me means that there is some sort of dominant um, strain, let's say, that can uh, that interferes with the propagation of the other ones when you put them into a brain environment that prevents. Uh, that only the uh, sort of the dominant one wins out in the end. Right, and I guess related to that from the from the chat, um, do the different disease causing variants of alpha synuclein form different different strains, different amyloid strains? Right, so that's a, that's a great question, and again, that's something that um, we're looking at in the lab. Um, so there's certainly been a lot of beautiful research, some structural biology research showing that. Um, with the recombinant proteins that these different um, mutations cause um, structurally distinct aggregates to form. So I, I know that's been done for G51D. There's a very nice paper out this week from Halal Ashuel that shows the similar sort of thing with a, a different mutation. Uh, in our hands, uh, what I would say is our research is pointing towards that the mutations don't necessarily modify um, specify a single strain, but they alter the spectrum of strains that can be formed. And so um, sort of early results from our lab will suggest that, for instance, wild types of nuclein may be able to form more strains than um, mutations, than, well, than sort of mutant versions of alpha synuclein. Okay. Um, ah, and now over to um, Kayla again for the, uh, Ah, yes, yeah, so I'm wondering, someone's wondering whether you used AMYLOFIT for the kinetic data and how the data were uh, for the aggregation assays were normalized. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we do always use AMYLOFIT uh, as a routine. I mean, I think the data that I've shown were before AMYLOFIT was, uh, you know, set up. So, you know, not specifically in that case, but, you know, we, we always do that. For the, for the normalization, uh, the normalization is one has to be very careful uh, because uh, you know typically one assumes that uh, you know the value of the plateau in the THT fluorescent signal um, can be used to divide um, uh, the signal itself, so the, the plateau is at one. Uh, but is obviously it is is prone to artifacts. Uh, for example. If uh, for some reason the amount of fiber is produced at the end of the reaction changes uh, with the concentration, uh, then this doesn't work. And you know, interestingly, the type of compounds that I've mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, stabilize the native state uh, of uh, of a beta uh, reduce the plateau because uh, it makes uh, less monomers available to forming fibers. So if you normalized. Uh, that type of results, you will simply miss uh, this, this uh, effect of the compound. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, one has to be very careful with the normalization. So do you, do you then focus more on the sort of changes in where the where the inflection points are for the kinetics rather than... No, no, sorry, we, we do the normalization, but we control yeah, yeah. by independent experiments uh, what is the total amount of um, uh, fibers that is, is generated to check whether the normalization is carried out. 
meaningful to me. Makes sense. Thanks. Um, and then for uh, for Joel, uh, what happens to protein aggregates using high concentrations of glucose and fructose? Um, the short answer to that is I, I don't know because we haven't done the experiment. Um, I can I could you know speculate that as you increase the concentration of any solute that you're going to then bias the um, uh, sort of formation of, of, of alpha synuclein into certain conformations. And so I, I would expect that will probably happen similar to maybe if you try using a molecular crowding agent or something like that, that it would probably shift the sort of the conformational spectrum of possible uh, aggregates. And so it's, it's an interesting question, but I, I haven't, can't say I've, I've looked at any of the, those specific um, molecules. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I was wondering about crowding agents, um, thinking about the salt and no salt. So that hasn't been done, to your knowledge, really. Um, it, well, we haven't done it. Um, hmm. uh, I can't recall off the top of my head if any other groups have specifically looked at, at PEG or anything like that. Um, interesting experiment. Maybe a, it's, a, it's a, a good idea. We'll have to think about that. Ah, another question for you there. Do the different strains interact with other or different proteins? Good question. Um, we have not specifically looked at that. I, I believe another group using their sort of different strains, uh, the, the group is, is escaping me at the moment recently. Um, I think it's a science advances paper. They. They, they did that sort of question um, and they did find different proteins in their sort of inclusions based on the uh, on the strains. Uh, I can't say that we've looked at that yet. It's something that we probably haven't done, but we should do. Um, and so I would, you know, I, I, I like the hypothesis that potentially that selective vulnerability could be um, mediated by different affinities of different strains of aggregates for, for cellular receptors for alpha synuclein. And certainly there have been several of these identified now, um, uh, uh, well, lag, lag three, I guess, um, prion protein, um, uh, sodium, uh, there's a, another sodium something, ATPase or something like that. And so I think it's possible, although I think, um, you know, it's impossible to comment so far because we don't, we don't really know. But I think that would be an interesting study to, to do because it could sort of hint at the mechanism of, of the selective vulnerability. Actually, on that uh, on that note, I think it would be very interesting to see how molecular chaperons, uh, for example, HSB70, can inhibit different strains. I don't know if this has been done. Yeah, uh, I 100% agree. And I've, I've we've we've done chaperone papers recently in our in our labs journal club, and we've all thought the same thing that man, we should really look at this because this is this could very well be what's um, sort of especially involved in some of the initial misfolding events and dictating what. Uh, can form in what cell types and and and, and whatnot. So I, I completely agree that there is a very um, good opportunity to investigate some chaperone biology with the. Yeah, HSD seventy looks uh, particularly promising in this sense. Okay, I have a question for for Michele. Uh, small molecules that inhibit oligomer formation, and small molecules that stabilize monomers. Are they equivalent? I wonder that because monomers are the ideal substrate for the protein degradation machinery of the cell. I mean, certainly, you know, stabilizing monomers uh, um, is, is going to uh, reduce the oligomer population. There are also other ways uh, to do that. Uh, so it's not, because, you know, the oligomer is this hub in the kinetic network. Uh, there are many paths that uh, lead to oligomers. So, one can block uh, the, the very first one, which is uh, um, the, the, the conversion of monomeric uh, proteins into oligomers, but, but it's not the only one. Thank you. Maybe I could ask a, a question uh, to, to Michele. Um, have you considered um, sort of the issue that you know, we, there's this problem that's inherent to, to, to many of the different proteins is that the, ag and that, in that the aggregates that you form spontaneously in a test tube do not necessarily recapitulate the structures of the aggregates present in the brain. And have you thought about trying to develop any kind of sort of brain sort of seeding assay to sort of force your synthetic A-beta to adopt those 
those brain specific structures. Yeah, I mean, George, that that's obviously is, is a key question, right? Yes, we 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 are thinking along these lines. Uh, well, as you know, as well as anyone, these are not easy to do, but uh, you know they are becoming possible, and so we are certainly considering them. I have a, a question for Joel. Uh, have you thought about the the relevance of diet for mice in the acceleration of the transmission of alpha synuclein aggregates. I mean, have you, do you think that fat diet may, may play a role in transmission from, uh, from mice to mice in, in vivo, I mean? It, it could. Um, certainly there is precedence um, in the Alzheimer's field for interactions between um, diabetes related um, phenomena and um, A beta uh, biology. So could it be true in for synuclein? Absolutely. I, we have not done any experiments uh, by exposing the, giving the mice different diets to see what happens. As you can see there's we have a, there's too many things we can do and that is not one of the ones that we've uh, attempted to do yet. but um, I, I do think that, that is, that's an interesting question. It's not one that I thought about at all so far. and so I guess I'll have to think a little bit more about it. Um, to, to be able to, to answer that question uh, uh, in any sort of, with any sort of reasonable certainty. Thank you. And there's a, a new question popped up uh, for uh, Michele in the Q&A section uh, from Claudio Fernandez, um, if you're... Yes, I can, you know, you know, look, Claudio, um, you know, the, the question is, uh, you know, if uh, we stabilize the monomeric states, we, uh, we may prevent uh, functional forms of alpha synuclein to form, like interaction with lipid membranes, for example. Um, and that's obviously not uh, something that we want to do. Yes, I agree with that. And this is why I think uh, the inhibition of oligomer formation uh, is uh, uh, the most appealing route after all, uh, because the oligomers have uh, no known uh, function and they only have uh, toxic effects. So uh, removing them uh, um, is the least likely uh, among all processes that we can consider, at least in, in our views, that is, you know, is, is, is the target that is least likely to generate uh, side effects. So great question.